Let's talk about the inverse secant function. So here we have the graph of the secant function, but with the vertical asymptotes removed uh, to keep things from getting kind of cluttery. So we're going to use this graph to get the graph of the inverse secant. So notice uh, this graph does fail the horizontal line test, because if we draw a horizontal line up here or down here, uh, it's going to hit the graph in infinitely many points. Okay, so uh, if we draw one up here, it hits the graph one, two, three, four, five, six times that we can see, infinitely many more over here, and infinitely many more over here. Um, so this does fail the horizontal line test pretty badly, but what we can do is restrict the secant function so that we're only looking at values between x equals zero and x equals pi. So uh, kind of goofy, but we can do that. So from x equals zero to x equals pi, uh, this is zero comma one, this is pi comma negative one. Um, remember the graph does go infinitely far up and infinitely far down, and there is a vertical asymptote right here at x equals pi over two. Okay, so um, this graph does pass the horizontal line test because any horizontal line that we draw is going to hit this graph uh, at most once. So horizontal lines right in here in between these two pieces um, don't touch the graph at all, that's fine. Uh, but if we go up here, any horizontal line touches the graph once. If we go down here, any horizontal line touches the graph once, and that's all fine. That's great. Uh, this does pass the horizontal line test now, so that means that we can get an inverse function. So remember, uh, if we have the graph of a function and we want the graph of the inverse, take the graph of the function and reflect it over the line y equals x. So if we take this, uh, these two pieces here and reflect them over the line y equals x, we're going to end up with uh, these two pieces here, this one here and this one here. Okay, so this piece right here gets reflected to this piece over here, and this piece down here of the restricted secant function, that piece gets reflected over y equals x over to this piece here. So let's just look at the inverse secant function just by itself. So that's what we have right here. Okay. So this is the graph of the inverse secant function. So it uh, goes infinitely far to the left, and then it stops up here at negative one comma pi, and then it starts up again at one comma zero and goes infinitely far to the right. Okay, so we kind of ignored the concept of the asymptotes here, uh, but let's go ahead and go back to that. So um, here we had a vertical asymptote right here at x equals um, pi over two. Okay, so now uh, we reflect that over the line y equals x. If we reflect a vertical asymptote, uh, x equals pi over two, if we reflect over the line y equals x, then we're gonna get a uh, horizontal asymptote at y equals pi over two. Okay, so x equals pi over two, that vertical asymptote, gets reflected over y equals x uh, to the horizontal line y equals pi over 2. Okay, so here's the inverse secant function by itself. Here's the inverse secant function with its horizontal asymptote at y equals pi over 2. Okay, so, and again, uh, it does go infinitely far to the left and infinitely far to the right, and it stops here at negative 1 pi and starts up again at uh, 1 comma 0. Okay, so that's the graph of the inverse secant function. Let's talk about some of the properties and how it relates to the secant function. So like we just saw in the graph, uh, the domain is uh, from negative infinity all the way up to negative one, uh, and including negative one, so square bracket, and then union uh, one to positive infinity, and including one, so we have the square bracket. Okay, and we, if we go back to the graph, we can see that here. Um, it goes all the way out infinitely far to the left, comes up here, it stops at negative one, and then it starts up again at positive one. Okay, so negative infinity to negative one, union one to positive infinity. Okay? So that's the domain, and the range uh, we see is 0 to pi over 2, union pi over 2 to pi. So basically from 0 to pi, including 0 and including pi, all of that except for pi over 2. Okay, and we see that right here in the graph. Okay, so here's the point uh, 1 comma 0, here's uh, negative 1 comma pi. We get everything in between except for the value y equals pi over 2, because that's where we have a horizontal asymptote. Okay, so that's what's going on there. So that's the domain and range. A little more complicated than the other inverse trig functions we talked about so far, but not too bad. So that's what's going on there. Some notation. Uh, y equals secant inverse of x. Okay. Um, negative 1 in the exponent there. Or we could say y equals arc seek of x. Or short for that, uh, cut out those two letters and we get y equals a seek of x. So this is uh, not really common, as common as it used to be, but people will know what you mean. It just depends on where you are, I guess. Uh, but three different ways of saying exactly the same thing. Uh, it's the inverse secant function. So three different ways of saying the inverse secant of x. Some cancellation properties. The inverse secant of the secant of x equals x, so we can just cancel like that if 0 is less than or equal to x is less than pi over 2, or pi over 2 is less than x uh, is less than or equal to pi. 
Okay. So that's uh, an x right there. So that's what's going on there. So basically, if x is uh, in this interval or in this interval here, then we have this cancellation property here. Okay, that, so that's nice. Um, now, what if we have secant of inverse secant of x? Well, that's going to equal x provided x is less than or equal to negative 1 or x is greater than or equal to positive 1. So basically, if x here is in the domain of inverse secant, okay? So uh, now for these two things, you might be asking yourself, what if x is not in this interval and it's not in this interval? Um, then as long as there's not a domain violation, you could still evaluate something like this, and we'll talk about that in a later video. And here for the second one, what if x is between negative 1 and 1? Okay, what if it's not less than or equal to negative 1? What if it's not greater than or equal to 1? What if it's between these two values? Well, then we just can't do that because here we're saying the inverse secant of x. Uh, we cannot evaluate the inverse secant of x um, if, x is, if x is not less than or equal to negative 1 and if x is not greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so basically, um, if x is between negative 1 and 1, then x is not in the domain of the inverse secant function. And that means that we wouldn't even make sense to do this. Okay, we just can't do it. There's no solution. It doesn't exist. So uh, there's no other way to do that. Um, there. Okay, so that's pretty much it uh, for the inverse secant function. But just a quick note about notation. So here we're saying y equals the inverse secant of x. So we do want to be very careful about that um, because that negative 1 in the exponent does not mean the same thing that it normally means for uh, algebraic expressions. So if we come over here, uh, the inverse secant of x is not the same thing as 1 over the secant of x. Okay, they do not mean it's the same thing. Um, so remember, for algebraic expressions, uh, that negative 1 in the exponent usually means do something like this, but for trig functions, uh, it does not work like that. Okay, so for trig functions, uh, this negative 1 in the exponent means um, inverse function there, and that comes from this notation where if you have a function f of x, the inverse is denoted f inverse of x like that. So negative 1 in the exponent, negative 1 in the exponent for inverse. So 1 over secant of x, that's actually the cosine of x, and the cosine of x is not the same thing as the inverse secant of x. Okay. So that's pretty much it for the inverse secant function. Uh, inverse cosecant coming up next, followed by some properties and examples of evaluating.